Hello and welcome to Unbounded Growth, a podcast that challenges you to grow and become a better version of yourself. My name is Mark Allen, and together with my friend Adam, we share thoughts and ideas from the books that we read and how they enhance our personal growth and development. We also host other readers and leaders. We learn from the experiences through our discussions. Our episodes air every Tuesday at 6 a.m. Central Standard Time. Thank you for listening in, and let's grow together on Bonded Growth. All right, all right. Happy Tuesday, and thank you for joining us here again on Bonded Growth. My name is Mark Allen Muteba. I'm your host. And as always, we my, co- my co-host, I try to call him my co-friend. <laughs> it's pretty much <laughs> my co-host and friend, Adam Shabindu. How are you doing, Adam? I'm doing well, Mark. How are you doing? I am doing amazing. I know we've been uh, at this book for a few weeks. We, we hope that we can finish it up today. Uh, there's still a lot of stuff to learn from here, but also a lot of stuff that we've learned in the last, uh, in the last two weeks. We hope that you'll join and learn a few stuff. Uh, before we get started... Uh, Adam and I were having a conversation here about marriage. Uh, uh, Plamidi, my wife, and I, we celebrated our one-year anniversary. I know to the, nowadays, one year is a big deal. People, <laughs> people are divorcing after two weeks. <laughs> so, uh, it's crazy out there. It, it is crazy. And I was telling Adam that just reflecting on that and reflecting on, on so many other things in life, um, a few lessons that I learned this week, particularly, well, in my marriage in the last year, I realized that communication is the key. One of the keys, or most probably the most important key for every successful relationship. If you want your marriage to be successful, I think 70%, if not more, of it falls on communication about your preferences, your preferences, the things you like, the the people you want to meet and everything, everything in between would literally fall on communication. So if you're in a relationship or planning to be in one, if you're planning to get married, maybe it's time to, to start working on your communication skills. Say what you mean and mean what you say. Absolutely. <laughs> it's actually very important uh, to be able to communicate effectively. In pretty much anything that we we can be looking at uh, in the aspect of life, and as you were mentioning, mm-hmm. uh, how that can actually be really, really useful for marriage and for the rest of us who are trying to actually put our <laughs> foot into marriage. Right. I believe that this is kind of a few pointers that we can take and use to our own advantages when you're going to come to relationship and when you're going to come to marriage uh, eventually. Absolutely. Yeah. And then uh, there's also a, a two books other than the one that we're reviewing right now, Eat the Frog. That's, that's a book I've, I've already read twice. But there is, uh, I was reading this book. I read it for actually two weeks. I, I wasn't able to, to do my one week challenge. Uh, I read that book for two weeks. It's called The Psychology of Money by Morgan Housel. That book is amazing. I mean, if, if you haven't got that book, you probably want to add it to your shelf. Maybe, maybe a few lessons that I learned from that book, or maybe the most important one that I learned. Don't, don't count the chicken by looking at the eggs. In other words, the only money you have is what you have in your pocket and what you have in your bank account. Yeah. <laughs> the rest of it that someone promised you, someone owes you money, or someone uh, you're waiting for some big old check to come from the government or whatever, it's not your money. The only money you have is what you currently have in your pocket, what you currently have in your bank account. So it's important to not bank on things that you do not have. To not, do not make plans on the money that you don't have. And, and, that's, and then the other thing that I found interesting in that book as well, is, of course, we're going back to the book that we're doing today, but the other thing I found interesting in that book was just learning the history of economics actually gave me some, I'll say some peace or some reassurance Realizing that the things that we are going through today, economically, have happened in the past. Depression, inflation, uh, gas going to crazy height or crazy prices. All that have happened in the history of the world and in the history of the United States of America. Like in the 1980s, the, the crisis of the oil. In the, 90, I think, 1970s and, and early 1970s and early 1980s. The crisis was so bad that a barrel of oil went from twenty dollars to a hundred and twenty eight dollars. Okay, that's crazy. And considering those times, <laughs> exactly. And when you think about it, it's like, okay, so we are going to be okay. 
you think about the housing market in Texas is going crazy. Oh yeah. The seven, oh, yeah. an apartment that we rented about five, six, seven years ago for seven hundred dollars. The same apartment is going today for sixteen hundred dollars and no bargain on it. Yeah. You you pay it, you take it or you leave it. And then I realized that this has happened in the past in Florida, where houses that were costing twenty thousand dollars. The same house started costing a hundred and twenty thousand wow. dollars. <laughs> you think about it, it's like okay, so this has happened. Maybe it's not the last time this is happening. It will happen again. But when things like that happen, are you financially secure? Because the reality is, in time of crisis, in time of trouble, some people still getting richer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it doesn't. Some people get That's the funny get, thing about the world. Exactly. Some people are still doing okay regardless of how the economy is. And regardless of how the economy is, when, when Trump was in power 2016, maybe all the way 2020, the economy was boosting. And I know some people were still doing bad. Yeah. So it doesn't matter <laughs> what is happening out there in the world. What matters the most is what is happening in your household, in your pocket. It's what you're doing with your money. It's what you're doing with your money. So the psychology of money is definitely one of those books that gives you a different perspective on money. Uh, I mean, he has his own view. He doesn't give any, any advice on how to manage your money because he says he doesn't know your situation. He doesn't know what you're going through. He doesn't know your, your current uh, circumstances. So uh, that, was a, that was a great book. I started another book. I'm reading that one a little slower. It's called uh, Tiny Habit by BJ Fogg. A wonderful book. A wonderful book. And I think even, even um, James Clear quotes him a lot in his book on, on, on the change, 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 uh, atomic habits. So, um, Tiny Habits is also a great book if you want to check it out. If you're thinking about changing your habits or uh, developing new routines and things of that nature. So, that, that's a great book. And I started another book on my tablet as well. It's called, it's called Soul by Bishop T. Jakes. <laughs> Bishop T. Jakes, he writes like he speaks. Like, if you've heard him speaking and then you're reading him, you can still hear like his voice and his <laughs> motivation. <laughs> so yeah. it's a very, it's a very interesting book uh, about how to grow and prosper. Adam, what, what have you been reading? Uh, I started a book called Good to Great by, um, I think it's Jim Collins. Jim Collins. Yeah. Yes. Good to Great. And that's, is more into entrepreneurship. It's more business. I yeah, think. it's a lot, yeah. a lot more business and actually. a lot of numbers. We, yes, uh, yes, I've read the book. I was, I was a little bit lost. French. <laughs> yes, so it was. Um, yeah, it's a lot of numbers. It's a lot of um, most of the book really is just business mm -hmm. uh, and how to really grow a successful company. Mm -hmm. uh, we need that right now. We're experiencing growth at Bora. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we are making it on TV. We are making it on like basically everybody has. Most people in our city have heard of the company. Mm -hmm. Now we are pushing really hard to growing the company now to grow a business, actually. Right. Uh, we are expanding a little bit more on our stuff and so on. So we are kind of pushing and a big, big projects are coming up. So it's, uh, I'm just trying to be prepared of that. Apart from that, I'm actually going to be taking classes on on finance, like corporate finance mm. uh, myself in the fall. I mean, I, we do have people who take on finance, but... It wouldn't hurt for me to actually understand. To have a 10,000 um, feet knowledge about yes, it. Yes, yeah. to understand exactly like what are the different things that uh, people go to when it comes to uh, finances of corporations. Mm -hmm. And apart from that, I'm also taking actually uh, in just similar because the idea of Bora is to try to expand at the global scale, not just um, the idea is to go. I have a friend of mine. Uh, his name is Moko. Uh, John Moko is over in the UK. And uh, he has created a platform called Congo to Global. Mm -hmm. And I've been inspired by that for so long mm. that I always think, okay, we are coming from Congo to Global. And the idea of Bora Technology actually is within those lines of, um, you know, there's actually a scripture from the, in the Bible where I think it was a Philip and a Nathaniel. Mm -hmm. They're meeting each other and then one is telling the other, like, uh, can there come anything good from Nazareth? Yeah, can, can anything come good from <laughs> Nazareth? Yeah. It, um, it's the same, actually, thing that um, we are kind of just pushing from Congo to Global. Can mm. anything good come from Congo? Mm. And we are trying to build a, 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 an institution, a company, in such a way that we're going to be coming from Congo to the Great Lake region mm -hmm. to the African level, mm -hmm. 
-hmm. and now using those same problems to be solving problems in other developing countries mm. all over the world. So the same technology that is needed in Congo might be the one required as well in Latin America mm -hmm. and Southeast Asia mm -hmm. and so on. Why not in America or Europe? Mm -hmm. There's uh, people always use a new innovation and new technology. Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, we are looking into that. So I'm also taking like an international business class where mm -hmm. um, I'm going to be looking at, okay, what are the different trade agreements and mm -hmm. the different stuff that's govern international business. So um, that book, yeah, good to great um, studying that. The other book I just actually finished this week was The 15 Invaluable Lessons of uh, uh, Laws of Growth. Of growth. That's, that's an amazing book. It was, it was so amazing that I think I highlighted uh, every page. <laughs> you know, it's, it's uh, funny because we, we've been discussing about uh, hearing that book on the show. It must probably starting next week. And, and one thing I was telling Adam this week, I was like, man, The 15 Invaluable Laws of Growth by John Maxwell is one of those books. I don't even know how to review it. I may as well just sit here and start reading it to you because there's just so many things in there and you may just end up aligning everything, even the page numbers. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it, was, um, it was so great that yeah, I think, I think um, it's kind of like now I'm, 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 I mean, I love the Bible. I read the Bible. Mm. Now I'm, I'm kind of starting taking that book a little bit like not as the Bible, mm -hmm. but a lot of the contents that he's saying in there, mm -hmm. there are things that I would like to be applying on my daily life, mm -hmm. almost as if I was actually taking it as a, not as a religion, but as a discipline mm -hmm. for my own personal growth in my own life. Because mm -hmm. he shares a lot of personal experiences in mm -hmm. there. He talks about other, other authors. I actually learned a few. Because when, when I'm writing my book, one of the things that I challenge with, mm -hmm. uh, it's like what, how much of the information in the book should be mine mm -hmm. and how much am I getting uh, from, from outside? Other because people. so yeah. far... Everything is coming from my my head, and I'm like, okay. And then you're, you're looking at, okay, I need to write like 120 or 100 page book, and I'm like, <laughs> okay, I'm, right now yeah. I'm like uh, 25, 38 pages already, yeah. And I'm trying to finish by the end of the year, mm -hmm. adding all the the other stuff that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, ah, maybe, um, well, how much can I get from somebody else and and stuff like that? So I'm reading other authors now, and um, and I after reading the 15 lessons, the, the 15 laws. Mm -hmm. um i kind of just um saw the kind of just the way it is written mm -hmm. how much of the information is quoting from like jim ron mm -hmm. zig ziglar and all the people that is quoting in that mm -hmm. and when he talks about them and i was like oh yeah this is a very interesting way of writing mm -hmm. it helps you because all these books are somehow connected he, he actually quoted Brian Tracy in the book. Yep. So I'm like, yeah, then I can, I can see those, the field I'm writing in. Mm. It does, there are not like tons and tons of tools that are exactly like mine, mm -hmm. but I can still um, use some of the information maybe in my introduction. Mm. What is that important thing? Why do we want to solve problems? Like, for example, because I'm writing on problem, solve, um, problem solving. Mm -hmm. Like, I can use some of those information from all these different authors, what they think mm -hmm. and try to incorporate that in my writing. So it's been quite a journey. I love that book and I'm hoping that one day I can actually meet, um, I can actually meet John, uh, John C. Maxwell. You know, it's been, a, it's been a dream of mine since 2011. When <laughs> I first, I, you know, John Maxwell is one of those authors. When, when I, I read the first book by John Maxwell, it was called Leadership Gold. It was one of those books that he wrote. Uh, it was kind of a devotional. You had to read a page a day and five days a week and, and do certain things like pray. And it was a Christian, you know, leader slash leadership book. But then I think for two years, the two years that followed, the only author I read was John Maxwell. And every time like I read a different author, there was something different. The, you know, as you say, it quotes a lot of other authors. And he talks like, and, and, and when you, you've been listening to him for a while and watching what he does, John Maxwell actually has a lot of, a lot of quotes. He has a book where he keeps all his quotes in alphabetical order. You know, it was yeah. born prior before technology was, was around. So he doesn't use a whole lot of technology. He mentioned recently that I started using his iPhone to record stuff like that. But it's just amazing how many things that you can learn from him. And John Maxwell is an amazing author. So if you haven't checked him out, check out John Maxwell, The 15 Invaluable Laws of Growth. And you, you will not be disappointed. We start talking about that book next week. It's a book that can stretch for over a month. But we try to keep it within, 
maybe within three to four sessions, try to talk about five, five laws. We don't, we don't want to read the whole book to you. Yeah. <laughs> we, we like to just give you enough for you to yeah. pick it up. And, and also and just, yeah, just, we would like also to just share our experience. Exactly. Uh, like, for example, I stretched that book. I was reading other books and finishing them. Like, for example, um, Eat That Frog, I, I mm. read the book like in less than a week uh, I was able to finish it. But that one, I've been stretching it um, since June, actually. Mm. I've been just uh, kind of like consuming part by part, part of part. the book. Mm. I started with audio book, and then I switched to what I do usually, where I'm listening to the audio, mm -hmm. and at the same time, I'm reading the book. Mm -hmm. That's where I'm actually, I'm actually getting the tone. I'm not giving the book my own tone. Right. I'm getting the tone directly from... Because uh, John Maxwell read his he own reads books. Okay. Yeah. So I can, I, exactly, I'm getting the tone of John Maxwell. What, what does he actually mean? Mm -hmm. You can feel the tone on his voice. Like, what, why is he emphasizing on here, on mm -hmm. this particular aspect? And mm -hmm. then... Uh, as I read that, and I, I just stretch it out for like over a month to accumulate all the knowledge that I could get from the book. Absolutely. And and by the way, if you need, you need, the, the link is free on YouTube. There's actually a free, a free version of the whole book on YouTube. You just tap the 15 invaluable laws of growth. Uh, whoever, whoever put it on there really broke it down into different laws. Every, every, every episode is like a different law. And, and if you, if you need to know more about it, just, oh, you, you can't find it on YouTube. You can email us at info at the unbounded growth.com. Again, our email will be info at theunboundedgrowth.com and we can always send you, share that, that link with you, all that information with you. All right, enough, enough of that. <laughs> let's, let's, let's get back into Eat That Frog. The, the, 12, the 12 thing that Brian Tracy talks about here in order to, to eat your frog or to kind of a law of, of success here, says identify your key constraint. It start off with this quote that I really, I really, I really like. It says, "Concentrate all your thoughts on the task at hand. The sun's rays do not burn until they are brought on to a focus." And that was by Alexander Graham. Yeah, uh, one of the things, if you think that I hear, uh, when you know your limitations, when you know what is stopping you from accomplishing what you have, when you know your problems, you can actually find solutions to them. Mm. And that's, I think, kind of the overall idea. Mm -hmm. about this particular part of the book mm -hmm. because some of the things he's, he's asking those are a few questions like what's holding, holding you back mm -hmm. what's getting on your way from accomplishing your goal at the end of the day like mm -hmm. your daily goals mm -hmm. and it's a few things that i've actually uh, been discussing uh, with different people i, I, I spend my time discussing with like um I've been thinking this past week because uh, I, I like really sharing the direct experiences from from this reading and from these books. Mm -hmm. Like I was just since I I read that part of the book, I've just been thinking, especially this week. Mm -hmm. It got just my mind into thinking. I have a lot of deadlines coming up, mm -hmm. so many things. I have my defense hopefully at the end of the year. Okay. I'm hoping that I, I get selected for the conference that is happening in um, in October here. Mm -hmm. So if I, I'm selected for the conference, then I need a lot of results to present because it's going to be an oral presentation. It's not just a poster. Right. So I have a lot of things. And in, in, apart from that, there's a company stuff going on. And some of the things that I actually identified this week is this exact chapter. Mm. I identify what is holding me back from accomplishing my my goals at the end of the day or at the end of the week mm. so i identified a few time like the time that i spend on my phone for example the phone calls i receive even more than the time i spend on my phone like let's say just using my phone mm -hmm. is the phone calls that i receive so, uh, sometimes the phone calls tend to be very extended so i started putting limits now i'm cutting off uh two hours per day of just focusing like today i did my two hours straight where i was just doing something that was relevant in my to-do list and and i think carl, carl newport talks about it in his book deep work it, it says how to create the flow a, a time where you are completely focused emerge into your work and one of the techniques he talks about is to block out technology every every sort of technology sometimes we don't realize how much of our time is being consumed by our phones and, 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 and phones are so funny. And I think we talked about this before on how uh, technologists and psychologists come together to put up these devices that we hold in our hands. And the one goal they're trying to achieve is to keep your attention. So if your phone 
is in your way of achieving your goals. Maybe at some point you need to, to learn. We all need. I mean, I'm, I'm talking about myself too. I need to learn to put my phone away. And I realize when I do that, even when I'm doing my reading. Now, one of the examples when, when people ask, ask me, for example, how do you read a book a week? Well, when I do my reading, like for half an hour a day, I don't have my phone with me. The only thing I have in the room where I'm reading is a book. The closest thing to me is a shelf of books. Mm -hmm. So my thoughts are all focused on books. So once you identify what is stopping you from accomplishing whatever you want to accomplish, then you can start moving on to, to, to avoid procrastinating on, on things like that. Yeah. The other thing that it says, uh, that is actually, it's another question that is there is what determines how fast you move. Mm. So once you've realized that uh, one, two or three things are the things that are holding me back, mm -hmm. then you can look at what is actually the, what helped me move faster. faster. Mm. What is the most efficient way mm. that I can use in this case mm. to actually move, move faster. Mm. And one of the things actually um, is just to me that says work is like just a setup of my, of my, of, of my monitors. Mm. Uh, I have three screens as well, like Mark has. Um, but my three screens, yeah, it's also two computers. So it's like, right. I have, uh, yeah, I have uh, one, my, my, my work computer, and then I have my personal computer that mm. is connected to my company work. And one of the things that's helped me move is just having those, like being able to move on, to work at my office, right. on my desk, mm -hmm. and having those different monitors putting things in such a way that I can actually see everything and it can remind me by itself that, hey, I'm still here. Mm. You still have to eat this frog. You still right. have to complete this task that's, that I have left. And all of them, usually I leave them actually, they don't, uh, most of my computers, well, all my computers, they don't, I think they, they shut off or they go to like in sleep mode probably after 45 minutes. Mm. Where Because I have, as long as I can still see that there, you know that you still yeah, have to it's get so it the helped way. me to move really fast, having mm. like money, many monitors when and, I'm working. Uh, and it's also important, even the way we talked about this last time, the way you organize your workspace can actually help you to be more productive in certain ways. Like if if you're studying and your TV is running in the background, how much more are you going to be effective versus when you're studying and you don't have any distractions around you? So most of the times we spend a lot of time doing the same thing, not because we are not capable of doing it, but because we are not completely focused. So we keep on missing some important details. We keep on missing the, the things that we need to focus on. And at the end of the day, we, we spend more time than we should have. So definitely identify the things that help you move faster and use them. And one of those things as well can be delegation. Absolutely. If, if, there, if you have a lot of stuff on your plate, and some of those stuff can be delegated to other people to do. Do it. Don't you? You don't. You don't have to eat all your frogs by yourself. I mean, if they're your frogs, then you probably <laughs> want to put them on your plate and eat them. But if there are certain things that can be given out to other people that can do the work more effectively than you, go ahead. Leave, uh, get them out of out of your plate and and and, and move a little closer to your goals. Yeah, and that's a, that's a really good point because that's actually the strength of leadership. Mm. When you are a leader, one of the main things that you learn is delegation. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, we tend to keep things to ourselves and feel like, yeah, we got to finish this. It's, this is on us. We are 100% responsible. But if there is somebody else who can help, if there is one actually thing that I'm good at, it's mm -hmm. asking for help. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. So it goes on to, uh, to, to the 13th point is learning to put pressure on yourself. Apply pressure on yourself. Thomas Edison said, the first requisite for success is the ability to apply your physical and mental, and mental energy to one problem insistently without growing weary. Learning to put pressure on yourself. This helped me a lot and it still helps me a lot in college. My deadline are two days before the official deadline. I'll explain what I do. So if I have a homework due on Sunday, my deadline is Friday. Putting that pressure on myself allows me to work a little faster. That by the time I get to Saturday and Sunday, I'm completely relaxed. Because I know all my work is already done, has already been accomplished. So learning to put pressure on yourself is, is learning not to go easy on you. Zig Ziglar used to say that 
if if you are tougher on yourself, he, he used to say, this is how he used to put it. He said, life is tough. But if you are tough on yourself, life becomes significantly easier. So learning to be tough on yourself will make your life a lot easier than learning to, 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 to give yourself some leeway because you don't feel like you're doing it, you don't want to do it. But if you're tougher, your discipline is hard on yourself, then your life becomes a little easier. Yeah, that's actually, and again, uh, this is one thing that I've also been applying. Uh, this, this book, I've just tried to, because I struggle so much with procrastination. Mm. We, I put up so many of my work, so, so much of my stuff. I could have been probably very advanced right now in life if I was not procrastinating. And procrastination most of feels my good, stuff. to be honest. It does. It feels good. It does. It's, it's, Until it doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> You you yeah you you feel like yeah maybe like you 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 create excuses you mm -hmm. you you make yourself feel okay that's mm -hmm. whatever like like for example I will procrastinate over um like I'm thinking like yeah I'm taking a break and this break is necessary mm -hmm. and then I'll tell myself yeah the break is good for my mental health and so on and then I read the I read business secrets from the Bible <laughs> and the author say that there are two words that are not in the Bible. One is vacation, the other <laughs> one is retirement. <laughs> so it's like, uh, yeah, I say, I'm not saying not to rest, mm. but I'm saying like vacation is not in the Bible. That means God did not plan it. So since God <laughs> didn't plan it, you should know, so you're not supposed to have vacations. Mm -hmm. But sometimes um, like, a lot of those things will kind of just get on my way uh, mm. for me to just push things back, procrastinate mm. on this, procrastinate on that, create this excuse. Mm. But one of the things that I start pushing, if you look at like now I have, I have this to-do list right in front on my on my cubicle, on my um, my drawers, my cabinets mm -hmm. that says everything, every task on there. Mm. It has a deadline on it, right. and those deadlines they are not enforced by my teach, by my advisor, my boss, or anybody. It's just my own. And people who actually are working with me or for me, mm -hmm. they are supposed to also abide on those deadlines mm. that I created for myself. Mm. And the other thing that actually pushes me also to create deadlines is also the people I work with mm. or people who work for me, mm -hmm. especially on Bora Project. Mm. They come and tell me that, they, or they ask me, when do we have to submit this by? Mm -hmm. And that forces me actually mm. to be able to create these, uh, these de deadlines. Mm. The other thing that I actually learned from this, from this book is like, apart from just putting pressure on, on, on yourself on this chapter, mm. he's talking about going the extra mile, mm -hmm. doing the extra thing that nobody else Will do. Is, actually, uh, is actually doing. He talked about uh, creating imaginary deadlines, as we said, mm -hmm. um, the, the other thing, just creating these imaginary deadlines. Mm. And when you create them, you place them there, they start become men becoming mental. And then you start feeling really bad if you don't meet them. Exactly. And mm. after that, then you try to feed them into your habits of creating those imaginary deadlines. Mm. And um, try this actually, this is one thing that has worked. Uh, it worked for me since high school and mm -hmm. it's still working. Telling people about it. Mm. I post my stuff on social media all the time and we we're going to get to that because there's a quote here that actually to me was so dear to me in the book. Right. But tell people about it. Tell mm. people about what you're doing and when you're going to finish it. Mm -hmm. Then whenever you're going to be seeing them, you're going to be feeling bad because somebody might ask you <laughs> that, uh, hey, um, did you get that task done? Mm -hmm. And if you did it, then yeah, then yeah, you're feeling bad. If you're in a relationship and you have like, let's say a girlfriend or a wife mm -hmm. that can hold you accountable for your own actions, mm. tell your girlfriend or tell your wife that, hey, I'm supposed to read 10 pages by tonight and I'm supposed to give you a presentation of the 10 pages that I read. Mm. By 10 p.m., your girlfriend or your wife is expecting 10 page presentation mm. you don't get it done you ask them like they should get upset at you right. it should become a problem there should be a price to pay for you mm -hmm. not accomplishing your goals and if you try that that would work it worked for me absolutely and, and i think one of our friends uh stefan lupopo uh, shout out to him he actually uh, started this 30-day challenge 
workout yeah. <laughs> and he was posting about it every day he told me the other day he said by day 10 i was so tired but then people were like if you do not finish this you owe me something yeah. you know so that actually helped him push i think he's on day 25 or 24 today and i mean he's almost there he's almost there it's it's always nice to share your ideas with others or maybe your challenges so that it can motivate you and encourage you one thing that adam mentioned that i didn't just want i didn't want to let slide is going the extra mile Zig Ziglar used to say this all the time. There is no competition in the extra mile. Think about it. If a marathon is for two miles and you run for the third mile, you don't have any competition. Everybody's done by the second mile. And it works in every single situation, whether it's at work, whether it's in your school or in your marriage. Every time you go the extra mile, you do a little more than is required of you. You get to a point where you start earning the respect of your peers, the respect of your superiors, and the respect of the people that are, are kind of working, you know, on not below. I, I hate using that subaltern. Your colleagues, you know, who, who may be, you know, under your current work position, you know. So it's important to learn to go the extra mile. And a few ways you can learn to go the extra mile, for example, when, when, when you're at work, everybody shows up at 7 a.m. Try to show up at 6 a.m. Start your work at 6 a.m. instead of 7. Yes, it's important to create that life and work balance. That's, that's very crucial. But you realize that we all have 100, I think 168 hours a week. What are we doing with our time? Absolutely. That's, that's a very important question. If, if, if you, let's, let's, let's be honest. You sleep eight hours a day. Down seven. What do we have? Do you have a calculator? I don't think I'm too good at mental math. Yeah, I think it's 600 and, uh, 168 um, hours. Because if, so, you have, yeah. if you're sleeping for 56 hours, you still have more than 100 hours in your week. What are you doing with them? Absolutely. That, that's actually... And then if you only work for 40 hours... If course, you only work for 40 hours, yeah. you subtract that, you will realize that you still have like 70 hours that you, you, you cannot account for. If, if I ask you today, if I meet you in person and ask you, what did you do last week? Okay, I uh, spent, uh, let's say, 10 hours commuting. Okay, let's get 10 hours out of 168. Well, I spent 56 hours sleeping. Let's get out. By the end of the day, we still found out that you still have 50 hours and you do not know what you did with that time. It's probably time to start reevaluating your life and what you're doing with your time. The other thing, actually, just just in that in in that same perspective, it actually falls uh, falls in place. Um, before I was coming here, I was talking to Percy. Percy takes care of our, our, our social media management, mm. and I was telling her about uh, the power of decision, mm -hmm. the power of decision. Yeah. We were talking about so, a subject that she was telling me, like you know, I get home and we have to do like family prayer and so and so. I told her that actually those are just a lot of excuses. I gave her the example that I just told you that I have a conference that I'm going to get to mm -hmm. in October. I have no result, mm -hmm. but by October, the results should be here. That's mean it's very important for me to have it done by October. Mm -hmm. There won't be any excuses. There won't be anything. There is the power. I talked, I was talking about the power of decision. Mm -hmm. Once you have decided something and you get on to just do it at that time, there's no excuse about time. Mm -hmm. The time is, it, excuse about time, or oh, I'm busy, it's the lamest excuse I ever heard. Mm. It's about prioritizing. Even in people's lives. It comes down to that. It comes down to that. When somebody tells you that, oh yeah, when you ask them like, hey, why why didn't you do so and so? Or why you didn't, didn't you get to together? Why didn't you whatever. report my message? They tell you that, that yeah, you know, I'm busy and so on. No, it's uh, just, it's the people are not the, busy. It's where in their priority list. You, you fall. You fall. People and will make time. I mean, I'm, I'm, you have I'm so guilty. many times in a day. I'm guilty so of it. Sometimes, you know, messages sit on my phone because, to be honest, they are not such a high priority for me. They, there may be an excuse for me to procrastinate, but if, if, if Plamidi, my wife, texts me, that's an yeah. immediate response. That's like <laughs> that's like nine one one. I, I cannot give an excuse for that. So it's not about you know. And and I used to feel bad when people would take long not to respond to me or things like that. And then I realized that maybe I don't fall on top of their priority list. Yeah. And when I realized that, I I wasn't feeling bad about it anymore. Mm -hmm. So stop, stop. Let's stop giving excuses 
about things when our priority are out of work, are out of work. Let's stop giving excuses about not having enough time. Let's do the inventory of our time. I, I mean, I challenge you. Do the inventory of your time, 168 hours a week. Take out your sleep time. Take out your, your, your eating time, your commute time, your work time. How much time do you have left? And what are you doing with that time? Uh, that being said, it, it says something here, and we conclude this chapter here. It says that successful people continually put the pressure on themselves to perform a higher level. Unsuccessful people have to be instructed and pressured by others. So the only way you actually maximize the pressure, your power, is to learn to put pressure on yourself and not receive that pressure from your boss. All right, moving on. Oh, the 15th steps, that, 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 that step that he talks about. Uh, actually, the 14th. The 14th. It says, motivate yourself into action. I love the way motivation. I like the way one person put it. Uh, this, this, this person actually said, Mot motivation is a motive for action. Yeah. <laughs> motive action. Yeah. Motive for <laughs> action. What is your motive for your action? And you need to learn, you know, you need to learn to be your own cheerleader. You need to learn to be the person who clouds for you the most has to be you. Because most of the times when you don't encourage yourself, when you don't motivate yourself, it doesn't matter how much of external motivation gets into you. And I mean, in the tiny habit, BJ Fogg, Dr. BJ Fogg talks about this. Motivation can also be a trap. And I think we talk about it when we talk about the power habit. Because if you are only doing things when you feel motivated to do them, there's only so many things you can do in life. Sometimes you have to learn to push yourself beyond your own beliefs. Learn to push yourself beyond, beyond your, your, I don't feel like doing it. Or this is not the right time to do it. Or I don't have it in me. I will do it when I feel like it. No. Motivation is pushing yourself into the action, of, into acting, into doing it when you need to do it. And there is something, there's something about this. Uh, when it comes to motivation, when it comes to being your own driver, your own cheerleader, the way I always look at it is that there's nobody else who can do it but you. Mm -hmm. So you need, there's no need for excuses. There's no need to be in a, there's somebody who asked, there's something I did this, this I never done something like that. This is kind of like very first time. Mm -hmm. I, uh, you'll be surprised. I would, I did these anonymous questions on, on, on Instagram where I let people ask me questions that I wouldn't know who they are. Mm -hmm. I didn't know people wanted to know that much about me mm -hmm. because nobody is like, has the guts to just stand up Reach out and, again, and, ask you yeah, and come question. straight up and be yeah. like, hey, I have an honest question. So about people this subject, try right? to hide behind, mm -hmm. behind something. And uh, somebody asked you actually... Um, told me, asked the question on how to get over a breakup. Mm. And I told them, okay, it's very simple. <laughs> what you do, you cry for 15 minutes. <laughs> and I, my friend, um, Angela, she's in France. She's the one who suggested that. It was funny, but it made so much sense. She said, you cry for 15 minutes and then you pick yourself right up and you move on probably to the next person. And then I added to that, it's like uh, a quote and basically it's in a song, uh, Waka Waka by um, Shakira, she sang in Africa for the World Cup. She said that, pick yourself up, dot yourself off mm. and go back into action. Mm -hmm. That basically what that that's what it is mm. when it comes to motivation, when it comes to you're feeling tired, you're feeling, there's nobody else who's gonna get it done. Mm. It's you. And at the end of the day, your deadline is not changing. Exactly. Uh, 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 mm -hmm. uh, go ahead. Yeah. So your deadline is not changing. And since mm. your deadline is not changing, you're still going to do it anyways. Mm. So the sooner you get on it, the better. You can actually finish it really fast and drive yourself to that. Like fuel yourself up mm. by yourself. And, and, and talking about that, uh, you know, life happens, right? And And sometimes we have problems, we have issues and... And they can be very discouraging. They they can actually stop you from having the motivation to do whatever you want to do. He, he had a quote here by Ed Foreman, which I would like to share with y'all. 
He said, you should never share your problems with others because 80% of the people don't care about them anyways. And the other 20%, I'm kind of glad you got them in the first place. It's funny the way he says it or the way he says it, but it makes a lot of sense. You know, one thing I've realized with us as human beings, even myself falling into it, most people that come with problems, though most people that talk about their problems, myself included, most of the times we're not really looking for solutions. Yeah. We just want to talk about them. Mm -hmm. We just want to share them with someone. And, and if that person stops listening to us, then we find someone else that we can talk to about our problems. The reasons why we, we are not doing what we're supposed to do. You know, the reason why we are not learning, we are not improving, we are not doing all these things. Listen, I believe, I believe in education. I believe in going to school, but I just do not believe that school is the only way to educate yourself. Someone like Abraham Lincoln, he learned law by himself. He never yep. went to school. Uh -huh. for law. He never went to law school. He started picking up books. He started reading books. We live in a time and era. We call it the information age. The information is at the, at the tip of our fingers. And there is no excuse for us not doing what we're supposed to do. There's no excuse for us not accomplishing the things that we're supposed to accomplish. So motivating yourself into action is also about finding out what are the excuses that you're giving yourself for not doing what you're supposed to do. Are you supposed to start a podcast? What are your excuses? Are you supposed to start a company? What are your excuses? Are you supposed to get married or to, to get with your spouse? What are your excuses? What is it that you want to do or you want to accomplish? But you give, you've been giving yourself so many excuses for the last month, for the last six months, for the last year. Get over those excuses and get to work. The other thing he mentions at the end, he says that control your thoughts. Remember, you become what you think of most of the time. Absolutely. That's, that's actually very important. Uh, and I think uh, there's a book that's, uh, that, I, that I read. It's called The Power of Positive Thinking. Mm. Uh, that's when I was actually at the very, very beginning of my journey mm. reading. I read that book and it was... Um, most of the book, actually, I could just kind of find the references, like, because he was a Christian writer. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the things he's just mostly talking about the Bible. He's talking about Christianity and so on. But it is, it's very important what you actually feeding your brain with or your mind with at uh, all the time, mm -hmm. because the more you actually like feeding yourself into positive thinking, mm -hmm the more positive you become mm -hmm. and actually the happier you become. And if you want to put in your mind some things that are negative mm. and when it comes to like, um, you know, motivating yourself, mm -hmm. you are looking down on yourself, you have a, a terrible image. There is something I was talking to my, because every two, every other week mm. I do a leadership training with um, our, our employees at Bora. Mm. And today I was actually talking and I was explaining to them about self-motivation. Mm. I was talking about self-honesty and just self-image, how to work on those things in such a way that they can actually reflect on you and help you create influence. So it's, um, it's important to pick yourself up and dust yourself off and keep yourself in action. And keep going. And, and, and the power the power of posing thinking, I think we, we definitely have, have time to talk about that. It is so important, the thoughts that you go to bed with, the thoughts that you wake up with, you know, one, one of the things that I suggest to people when, when they ask me how, because I used to beat myself up too much, man. I beat myself up. I got too close to it twice in my life. I tried to, to, to take my own life because I thought I was useless. I was like a salad. Like I didn't, oh. I wasn't, I wasn't important for anybody in this world that anybody would ever need me. How did I get out of that? A lot of it was, of course, with my Christianity and my spiritual journey, you know, knowing the Lord better. But part of it as well was just learning to appreciate life, learning to appreciate the things that I have, learning to appreciate myself, the life. You know, the life that you neglect sometimes is a dream for other people. Oh, yeah. Definitely. The things that you say, okay, you know, it's just a car. I hate it. Or it's just, it's just a pair of shoes. It's just a pair of basketball shoes. I hate them. They don't even look good on me. A lot of people appreciate you and appreciate what you have. So one thing you can do right away, if you, you would like to learn to develop positive thinking in your life, one of the things that I would suggest you do right away, start writing down 
the things that you are thankful for. And we all have things that we are thankful for. We are, we are thankful for. And once you start realizing that, hey, I'm thankful for A, B, C, D in my life, and focus on that. Give that 100% of your attention. And eventually, it takes time. I, I, won't, I won't promise you that this is a quick work, quick formula that we go overnight. No, it takes time. Sometimes, what I used to do as well, uh, I started really listening, of course, to a lot of sermons, but I used to listen to so much Zig Ziglar. He was a motivational speaker. So by the time you listen to him, by the time he's done speaking, you are pumped up. You feel like, oh man, I'm actually something. And then two hours later, you feel down. What will I do? I'll pop up another, another tape of Zig Ziglar and listen to it again and again. And eventually it started helping me develop a more positive self-image to be more appreciative, not only about my life, my family, the beautiful wife that God gave me, the, the friends that I have around me. I realized that I was so blessed but the whole time I was focusing so much on the negative things in my life, like negative today that I realized were kind of stupid as well. I was feeling bad about myself because I had a bad grade. I mean, who, ca who would care <laughs> about a bad grade 50 years from today? Nobody will. So pick yourself back up, motivate yourself and the power of positive thinking. So the chapter 15 and 16, we are going to combine those two because they talk, it talks about the same subject. 15 says that technology is a terrible master. And 16 says technology is a wonderful servant. I know Adam was waiting for this. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. M more 15, yes, he, he, he puts a few pointers that I kind of uh, took a note. He's, he's just, he's telling you not to be an addict, mm. uh, first of all. He said that don't just, a lot of those stuff you don't need them. Uh, you don't need to know what actually happened in the news. Uh, most people, every five minutes yeah you don't you don't need to actually know even the whole day mm -hmm. even actually in the whole week mm -hmm. what if when that part of the news becomes important to you you will know you will know uh, trust that's, me that's you what will he know. says <laughs> when it oh, when the price of gas went up we all found out exactly yeah, yeah. that's the only thing that you up you actually really care for mm -hmm. unless like okay we live in the modern age where uh, people actually work with with the internet and mm -hmm. people are working online and maybe if that's what you do for work, then yeah, maybe it's become very important. People who do like a lot of data analytics based on the internet, mm -hmm. um, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But you don't really need uh, technology twenty four seven. And it gives one suggestion here, which which I definitely need to try this. It said resolve to unplug from technology for one full day each week. By the end of the digital de detox, your mind will be calm and clear. When your mental batteries have time to recharge, you become much more effective at eating your frogs. And then moving on, it goes on to talking about technology is technology is a wonderful servant. Yeah, this is a, a actually my whole pretty much like the life I'm, the life I'm living today is actually because of most of the technological advances that have been, especially the power of social media. Mm. We started off Bora, no employee. Um, it was just me. Right. No great thing, actually. Like, now, I had a vision. I knew I wanted, and I think I, think I shared that last week. Mm. But what I did, I just used my WhatsApp. Mm. I posted, like, hey, we are hiring. And uh, I got people to submit their resume for me. And people trusted me because, of course, I had just got my master's. Mm. And also just um, a lot of people tend to trust the stuff that I that, that I tend to say, which is, I really do appreciate it. It humbles me all the time. Mm. And yeah, just like that, shared on WhatsApp, somebody took a screenshot, shared with somebody else, we shared with somebody else. I started working with people I don't even know. Mm. But like, we now we are a big family, Bora family. Mm. Uh, same thing with people who share our stuff on Twitter and um, LinkedIn, actually. LinkedIn got me to talk to president's advisors mm. just because my LinkedIn post got popular, I guess. Some um, people liked it a lot. And uh, the president of Congo, the advisor of the president of Congo started reaching out mm. um, some of our work. So it's, uh, when it comes to that part of our uh, side, because at, at Bora, I usually make a joke that I'm a CEO, chief everything officer. <laughs> so I take care of our uh, marketing. I take care of social media management. I take care of everything around. Right. So it's kind of like, um, yeah. there's something actually that's um, inspired me in this chapter where he's talking about social media and or, or he's just talking about technology in general, where it can actually be a great servant to push you, to motivate you to accomplish 
your job if you use that technology effectively. One thing that he said, and I'm going to quote here, he said, posting on social media about your progress is a great way to reward yourself mm. for making headway on long-term projects. Mm. When the payoff is far in the future, it can be hard to stay motivated. Mm. So getting likes or hearts from your followers on your daily updates can be a way to achieve a mini payoff. Mm. I am telling you that thing, it's very gratifying. Mm. When I post something on social media mm -hmm. and so many people liked, mm. when I post something about my research, which is like a long-term project, right? Yeah. I posted there a small accomplishment on my research mm. and I have so much love on Twitter. Mm. It helped me like push, okay, next time I'm going to put another thing here. I'm going to get more people to like it and it's really motivate me to move forward. So I, I'm kind of biased on this chapter specifically. <laughs> and, 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 and talking about that, you know, the likes and the beautiful things on Instagram and, 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 and that, we're talking here when you come to your personal project, your personal accomplishment. But you should not let your life depend on that. We've seen a lot of people choosing to end their lives, to take their lives, because they lost a few followers on Instagram or because they lost a few followers on Twitter. So there's very a finite line, the way he's talking about it. As long as you are using technology, as long as you're using technology as a tool, not as your master, not as your servant, as long as you are not completely dependent on technology, technology can actually serve you in, in great ways. Like one of the challenging things that uh, most of us do, what's the first thing we do every morning? Check our phones. We check our phones. For what? For what reason? What is it that we have on our phones? And, and, and one of the stuff that he, he, he suggests here in, in using technology, he says that resolve to turn, all, turn off all your unnecessary notifications. I'll tell you what I did. If you live in America, in the United States, in Canada, maybe some part of Europe where Amazon is kind of, Amazon and eBay work a lot, you probably relate to what I'm saying. I uninstalled eBay and Amazon from my phone. Adam, you see the way people browse Facebook and yeah. Twitter and Instagram? That's the way I used to browse eBay and Amazon. Uh, that's, a, that's a huge temptation out there. And, like, and you, you cannot realize how much money yeah. I have saved. <laughs> that's an expensive hobby. <laughs> that's, I've saved a lot of money simply by uninstalling Amazon and eBay, yeah. I realized that they were taking a lot of my attention. I was always after the latest gear. I was always after the one thing that is missing in the ingredient to make things perfect. And yeah. I know really, I'm, I'm kind of a perfectionist in, in, in a way, you know, and, and, and I realized that just by doing that, it saved me a lot of time. And, and even I don't have Instagram. I, I don't have Instagram on my phone. I don't have Facebook on my phone. All those applications, I removed them from my phone. I made it harder for myself to reach out to all these social media applications so that when I use them, they are actually serving to a beautiful purpose. They are actually serving me and helping me accomplish a few things. Another thing that you can do with technology or your phone, use your phone calendar. Sometimes, you know, I mean, back in the days, people used to work with these big journals and agendas and stuff. Today, use your phone calendar. When people give me the excuse like, oh, I didn't do A, B, C, D because I forgot. I'm like, you have a phone in your hand and you forgot? Like, what do you mean you forgot? Yeah. <laughs> Every time someone tells me something important that I have to do by a certain deadline. As a matter of fact, people are like, oh, Mark, man, you got good memory. You remember a birthday? No, I did not. When you tell me today is your birthday, I set it on my phone and I set it a reminder for every year. At 730, every year, remind me that it's this person's birthday. And on that day, I text the person to say, hey, man, happy birthday. And people are always surprised. I'm like, it's 2022. You have a phone. You shouldn't have excuses like, I forgot to do ABCD. While you can set an alarm on your phone to remind you the time. And even you can, you can put notes in your calendar. Yeah. And there is actually another, there is another, uh, one of my colleagues, Taylor, actually, he followed us a lot, actually. And shout out to Taylor. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, Taylor shared one thing when we were at work dinner this, this past week. Mm. He said that he actually uses Siri to record his dream. And I went, how? 
Yeah. So I was like, me, me, I forget my dream as soon as like I wake up. But when I wake, up, yeah. I, I do the same thing. Yeah, I actually write them. Like yeah, I text so what myself. What he does, <laughs> yeah. uh, what he does, mm. he actually he say that when he's um when he's 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 he woke up from a dream and mm. whatever he say, hey Siri, and then uh he get a few of the words, some mm. some keywords. That will Siri, help you remember the whole that picture. That will help him remember the whole picture. So mm. that's one of the most effective ways. Actually, I didn't know. He's like, yeah, because he was he he started with like you can do something with your sleeps. Mm. I was like, I I don't get it. And then he explained that. And I, I was like, yeah, this is really uh, a good thing. And the reality about dreams, I don't care if you're coming from a, a religious, you know, side of the world or you're coming from a completely atheist side of the world, dreams are powerful. Yeah. A lot of a lot of technology scientists actually solve most of their issues in their dreams because your subconscious mind is still working while you're sleeping. And sometimes, I mean, from a religious world where we come from, God reveals to you certain things in your dreams. And sometimes, whatever you believe, your subconscious mind can also start doing certain things while you're sleeping. So, maximize the power of your dreams. You never, you never know. Some, some of these great inventions that we have today came from dreams. So, very, very, very important. The, this, on step 17, it talks about now uh, focus, focusing your attention. And it talks about something here that we all say, I'm good at multitasking. No, you're not. Multitasking is a myth. What we all do, we task shift. You cannot focus. Your brain is not powerful enough to focus on two demanding activities at the same time. Adam cannot do a serious research and have a serious phone conversation about a different subject at the same time. No. <laughs> it's, it's just impossible. Yeah, you say, okay, multitasking. I'll tell you what multitasking is. Can I do my laundry while I'm studying? Yeah. The machine is running, it's one task at hand, and I'm studying, is another task. Those are two different things. Dr. Dr. Donna O. Johnson Mackey, who's my mentor, actually shared this with us. She gave us a simple exercise to help us realize that multitasking that we think we do is a myth. She, she told us, write on a paper, multitasking is a myth, and time yourself. Of course, we read on a paper, that was like less than five seconds. And then she said... Write one later. Tap your, tap your knee and then write the second letter of the same phrase. Multitasking is a myth. But write one later, tap your knee with the same hand and then write another letter until you're done. The reality is that it took us a lot longer. Of course, you're writing one letter, you're tapping one thing. And it's told us, she told us, this is what multitasking is. You are writing, you're switching tasks, you're stopping to write and you're tapping your feet, your foot. That's already a different task. And, 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 and I realize that most of the times we're thinking that we are multitasking, we're actually spending more time doing the things that we can do in less time if we sink, we, we, we focus sink, <laughs> we focus on only one, one, one task. Yeah. yeah, and something he mentioned, actually, he said that we don't actually multitask, we task shift. shift. Yep. Yeah, he called it task shifting. shifting, shifting and yeah. that, I think what I thought about it was like, yeah, this this actually makes more sense. Mm. Should just actually focus on only one thing. And one thing he gives some solution here is, um, and, and I'm going to quote here, he say, keep your goals of success and high productivity in, in mind. mind. Mm. Before you do anything, ask yourself, is this helping me achieve one of my most important goals or is this just a distraction? Like today, my distraction, uh, <laughs> I was supposed to uh, <laughs> to sit down here and do one of my quizzes. And then I realized that my tire, uh, the, the, the tire of my, my bicycle was, was kind of popped or something that came in there. And I thought it was just interesting to uh, to to fix it by myself. <laughs> it, it was fun to do, but did it actually help me to complete what I was supposed to? Nah, it did not. So it's important to ask yourself that question all the time before you take on a project. Is this helping me accomplish what I need to accomplish? Now, step step 18 is, is an interesting one. It talks about slicing and dicing the task. 
breaking your big project into multiple simple tasks. And I'll, I'll just give the quote he gave at the end because this is this really captured my attention. And Adam Adam can can definitely relate to this. I've also been writing a book. Uh, it's a Christian book. It's called Undefeated. You know how how to overcome your your sin, your your addictions. How do you go about overcoming that? And and one thing. I struggle with is because I'm waiting for the day where I have enough strength and motivation to sit down and write. It happens every once in, in five years <laughs> where <laughs> I have a lot of motivation and I'll sit down for two hours and just write for two hours focus. But then it doesn't happen for the next five years. And if, if, if that's the strategies I'm going to use to finish this book, I will never finish it. Now, he says this at the end, and I love what he says here. He says, I have several friends who have become best-selling authors by simply resolving to write one page or even one paragraph per day until the book was completed. And you can do the same. Whatever your project is, whatever it is that you're trying to accomplish, if you can break it down to such a small task where you can do one thing for an hour or for even 10 minutes, even for five minutes, you know, people have writer. Uh, I've heard it, the writer's block where it's ideas are not just not flowing. Some other people, I, I, I created this. Maybe some other more, someone else talked about this as well. Is the reader's block where some days you just simply cannot read. You try all you want, but you don't have enough power, motivation to read. What I do, I created a five minute rule. I will sit down. I will not read for more than five minutes. I'll literally put the timer read for five minutes, close my book. But I'd rather make a little progress every day than make no progress at all. Something that I've re learned from this book and from that chapter that I'm trying to actually, um, to, 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 to actually do here is also something he says to become action-oriented. Hmm. Is to try to get things done when you are supposed to get things done. Take the action directly. And he said here, he said, become action-oriented. A common quality of high performers mm -hmm. is that when they hear a good idea, they take action on it immediately. Immediately. Don't delay. Mm. Try it today. Absolutely. That is a uh, that is one thing. I want to read this book. I get on it and I get on it now. Mm. When uh, I want to do something, that is I think my biggest strength. When people ask me what is the biggest strength, when there is something. Okay, Adam, do you think you can add me to a group that gonna, we're going to do one, two, three things? Adam, can you help like my sibling or my friend to, mm. to, to get this thing okay directly? I reach out to that person. I make sure that part of the thing is off it's my way. Yeah. As soon as, this is how I am. As soon as I tell you I'm going to do it, mm. I won't. <laughs> I'm gonna, <laughs> most, I'm, most of us. Unless you remind me mm. about it, it is gone. When you ask me, when I tell you that I'm going to pray for you, mm. that's all. That's the prayer. That's the entire prayer. Mm. What I just said, that's the prayer. Mm. Because I won't go there. But, but what I'm telling you that I'm going to pray for you, and I just get on my knee at that time, mm. and I pray for you, then it's a done deal. I don't, it's really hard for me to go back to stuff or to just remember to going back to stuff. Mm. With if I'm not doing them, I really that time you have to remind me to force me to actually now remember. Mm. But I get things done as soon as I think about it, and I don't do one of the other things I don't do. If I tell you that you ask me for something or whatever, and then I tell you I'm gonna think about it, mm. I probably will, probably won't. But mm. I won't have my mind actively on it. Mm. I might sleep on it, mm -hmm. but. I won't go there thinking about it. Mm. So I really make my decisions as soon as possible. I just say whatever I think can be done. I can look at the logistics later, mm. but I get it done. And, and that's very true because most of us, we, we give false promises and false hope to people that I'll do A, B, C, D, and then we don't do it. Uh, one of the techniques, as Adam says, is just to do it right away. And if you cannot do it right away, what is the earliest time you can do it? If it's an email that you need to finish or it's someone that you need to call. I've, I've started developing this habit now. You know, when I think about someone that I haven't thought about in a long time or I haven't talked to in a long time and I need to call them, I call them right away. I'm not waiting for tomorrow because when tomorrow comes, I will forget again. Which 
relates a little bit to the next to the next chapter when it talks about slicing and dicing your task. The next thing you want to do is to create large block of time. Learning, man, that's that's such a powerful tool that I've noticed. Every time I use it, I'm more productive than when I don't. If you say, for example, and this has helped me a lot in the reading, when I say I will read from 9 to 9.30, my wife and son know that dad is reading. And we're not going to disturb him. I literally close the door of the office and sit down there, put on, put on ear, ear plugs or just, you know, noise canceling headphones, listening to some soft music. And the only thing I'm doing at that time is reading. Creating those blocks of time actually helps you become more productive when you want to get stuff done in a project. And Adam knows about this because of research. When you're doing research, sometimes you just have to sit down for that length of time in order for you to get a breakthrough and if you say okay i'll do it in five minutes no sometimes the five minutes don't cut it sometimes you really have to focus and and, and spend and spend that time one of the things he said that one of the best work habits of all the time is to de- to develop is to get up early and work at home in the morning let's say for example that you you, you have to start your work at 8 a.m you will be more productive at your work or even in your personal life if you learn to get up early, maybe an hour or two hours before you start doing your work. And one thing we've noticed about all the successful people, they get up early. Yeah. <laughs> Most of them get up early. They get up before everybody. So I, you, I hear people, I was talking to, to a gentleman, a wonderfully, he's a wonderful software engineer that I work with. He's really good at what he does. And I asked him, I was like, what's, what's your, your routine like? What do you do in order for you to improve your skills? He told me I wake up every day at 3 a.m. I read news about software engineering. I, I, I do my research between 3 a.m. And, 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 and 5.30, 6 a.m. in the morning. By the time we all show up at work at 7 a.m., the dude has already had three hours on work on personal development. How can you compete with someone like that? It said that the famous Kobe Bryant used to work out like from 3 a.m. to 5 a.m. And then he will come back to the gym again at 7 a.m. By the time y'all showing up for practice at 9 a.m., he's already had like five hours of work, of workout. Like, how can you compete with that? So if you want to beat your competition, if you want to be the best at what you do, learn to work a little longer. Learn to go the extra mile. Yeah, and one of the points, one of the key points, uh, my, my key takeaway here is saying that make every minute count. And it's exactly mm. what, what you, you just mentioned here. He said, work steadily and continuously without diversion or distraction by planning, preparing your work in mm. advance. Mm. Most of all, keep focused on the most important result for which you are responsible. And mm. This is very important. He said somewhere else in that chapter where he's saying like to actually about to achieve this, mm. put that block of time, take about 90 minutes every morning mm. when you get to work mm-hmm. to just do productive work. work. Mm. And after that, reward yourself. You give yourself, I don't know, 20 minutes on social media, 20 minutes on, on your phone, whatever it is that you want to do, just give yourself that time and then take another 90 minutes and once you've done that okay do something else and i'll tell you why this is powerful to to be up early before everybody or to be late after late is kind of hard because you're tired mentally you're tired especially if you've been at work for like 18 hours you're tired by that time when you up and work before everybody two things first of all there's no distraction because the rest of the world is sleeping secondly it's quiet you don't, you don't have kids running in and out of your room. You don't have your colleagues stopping out to, to talk to you about coffee or the, less, the, the, the late basketball game. You don't have things like that. When you get to the office early before everybody, you have enough time to focus and think about what you need to do. Let's jump to top, chapter 21 and then get back to chapter 20. Because chapter 21 says that single handle every task. And I think it talks about it a little bit more in chapter... Uh, that was chapter eight, uh, 18, maybe 18, oh, 17, where it says focus your attention. So the concepts are pretty much the same to, to learn how to do one thing at a time. He talks about a little bit about discipline here, where it says the ability to make yourself a discipline is the ability to make yourself do what you should do when you should do it, whether you feel like it or not. 
And this is the thing, the key, whether you feel like it. Most of us think that discipline, you got to feel like it to do it. No. Discipline is whether you feel like it or not, you do it. If you're supposed to wake up, you wake up. Whether you, you, you have it in you, like do what you're supposed to do. And it takes time to develop. It takes time. It takes practice. You try one day, the second day it doesn't work. Don't give up. Don't give up on yourself. Keep pushing yourself beyond your limits. And when you get to work, mm. when you start doing something, mm. keep doing. The only way to actually finish your work when you've started working, mm. keep on working. Yep. It's the only way to accomplish. The only way actually to be successful. Mm. You started a company, you started a business. The only way, even if, you know, Bora, we did a, an idle year. We had like a, almost a whole year. Mm where everything was just so idle. And I was asking myself, blaming myself for everything all the time. Mm. But one of the things that we actually, one of, we didn't make a mistake of closing down. Mm. I still motivated my people. I still tell them it's coming. It's going to be turn its way. Mm. And now we are actually thinking about expanding. So it's, um, it's just that when you start doing, keep on working. Mm. Now, chapter 20, which will be the last chapter. I know we already be 10 minutes over, over the hour here. But this is, I love this chapter because it does not only apply to avoiding procrastination, it also applies to life. It says, develop a sense of urgency. Napoleon Hill said, do not wait. The time will never be just right. Start where you are, where you stand, and work with whatever tools that you may have at your command. And better tools will be found as you go along. Another person says it in a way that a lobby say, go as far as you can see. When you get there, you'll be able to see farther. If you wait for all the lights to be green, you shall never leave your house. Yeah. Develop a sense of urgency. I don't know because most of us youngsters in our 20s, maybe 30s, it's, it's sad when you see that in the 50s. We kind of live thinking that tomorrow is given. We live in a way that we don't realize that this life can be snatched away from us at any single moment. I've seen babies die. I've seen old people die. I've seen youngsters die. And the only time we have, like money, the only money you have is what you have. It's not what was promised. It's not what, 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 is, you know, what, what is expected. The only money you have in your life is what you have in your bank account and in your pocket right now. If it's $2, that's all you have. And the only time you have in life is today. Tomorrow is not guaranteed. We can wake up tomorrow. You, we, we all could wake up tomorrow and it's the end of the world. We could wake up tomorrow and it's the end of your world. Do you live with a sense of urgency? Do you live in a way that you know that you need to do what you need to do when you need to do it? Whatever it is that you have to do. Live a purpose-driven life, like Rick, Rick Warren would say, live a purpose-driven life. If you have a project, get on it. If you have a dream, get on it. If you have a girl that you've been looking at for the last five years and you can't open your mouth, go to her. Like, what, what's the worst that could happen? If you have a job, you've been dreaming to work at Google, apply. What are you waiting for? What's the worst that could happen? I love what my boss, I call him my boss, he's my mentor, uh, Mr. Tyson Bounty, used to tell me. What's the worst that could happen? They say no. Exactly. I, <laughs> and I've what? been telling that to people when you come to college applications. Yeah. Like people, oh, I don't want to apply to MIT because, you know, it's MIT. I'm like, what can you, what do you have to lose? What do you have to lose? It's just the worst possible answer you can get is no. It's no. They, they're and, not. Oh, no, never kill anybody. Uh, no. It's a no and you move on. Uh, you know, as, as I'm growing, I'm growing older. But I always encourage people, if you're still in your 20s, make as many mistakes as you want. You still have a lot of, I mean, if you have to live up to 60, by the time you get 30, you still have 30 more years to recover from the mistakes you made in your 20s. And I think a lot of us, we actually do well by, by the time we, we get 35. We, we don't take that, that much time. Abraham Lincoln he got into debt in business. He was in his 20s. It took him 30 years. He, he, he didn't pay off his debt until he was in his 50s. And he still became the president of the United States. What's the worst that could happen? I want to encourage you. And I want to challenge you. Whatever it is that you are trying to accomplish, whatever dream, whatever vision that you have, 
What's holding you back? What's stopping you from doing it? I mean, what's the worst that could happen? You fail? That's okay. All the great successes we see out there, they they fell so many times. Thomas Edison, he had 9,000 different experiences before he had one light bulb coming on the way he wanted it. Now, think about it. 9,000 different experiences. I don't even think if I'll, I'll stand 100. But he never gave up. Today, none of us here talks about his failures. We all talk about what he was able to accomplish. What is the sense? Are you living your life with a sense of, of, of urgency? Or are you, are you just chilling and say, okay, I'll, I'll do fine by my 30s or I'll do fine by my 40s? Who told you you're going to live to 30? Who told you? There is no guarantee. There's no guarantee that I would be here till 40. My prayer is that I may be here till 90. But if, 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 if God in his goodness decides to take me home early, what, what can we do about it? And at the end of the day here is actually get on to work. Hmm. Whatever it is that you're supposed to get done, you want to create a company, get on hmm. and do it. And after you've started it, you start developing momentum. Exactly. And um, for people who watch basketball, mm. right, it's like basketball, they call it the game of run. Mm -hmm. The team that started off with the strong momentum and keep on going, or the team that's tried to finish the game with a lot of momentum, is the team that wins the game. It's hard to break it. it it's really hard. It's really, when you got the momentum going, mm. keep the momentum going. Stay on fire. Mm. Don't ever let the fire die. And don't, and, and don't take a timeout because that's what both coaches we do. Yeah. When they see the other team <laughs> developing momentum, time they out. take a timeout. Because don't. they want to break. Don't, do not take a timeout. No time so, Just get on to work. Get on to work. Work every day. Work with passion. Work with dedication. And, uh, you know, inspire. We, we're here to inspire your growth. We're here to, to raise some leaders. And if you become one of the leaders that will be impacted by this podcast and impact other leaders in your generation, if your name will be written in the books, maybe not the books of the world, maybe the books of your family, maybe your books of your neighborhood, maybe the books of your school, whatever it is that you need to do, whatever God has gifted you with, whatever you've been called to do, do it. Do it with all your heart. Get to work. Don't 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 wait for another day. Don't wait until you the kids are out of school to do what you want to do. Don't wait until you get your degree to do what you want to do. If you can do it now, if you can do it today, start today. It is with that what we we'll be concluding our our podcast today. Uh, we hope you had a great time reading this book. And if you haven't got a copy, please get yourself a copy of Eat That Frog. Get yourself a copy of that book. It's a wonderful book, small book, but a lot of lessons that we can learn from it. Next week, we we'll start talking about the the most wonderful, one of the most wonderful books that I've read in, in my life. One of the many, I think I have maybe, Adam can see on my shelf here, I have maybe 15 books from John Maxwell. I just love the author and the way he talks about it. If you want to get a head start on it, get started on it. The 15 Invaluable Laws of Growth. Once we finish that series, we get into the financial uh, aspect of it. We talk about The Seven Secrets of Money by Mary Hunt. Just a wonderful book. Simple book. Teaches you uh, the story about Mary Hunt. She went into debt when she was in her 20s, maybe her 30s. She went into debt. She had more than 100,000 credit card debt. And she worked hard to pay them off. She never filed for bankruptcy. And she teaches some of the strategies that she uh, she used in that book. So uh, stay tuned. And uh, if you have any questions, of course, you can always feel free to reach out to us at info at theunboundedgrowth.com. And we are also on Instagram, Unbounded Growth. Uh, you can always reach out to us there. And if you you have any concern or any any suggestion for an improvement, uh, do not hesitate to post your comment. We're on YouTube. Uh, don't forget to subscribe and Turn on your notification bell for that every time a new episode comes out, you you are notified. Of course, we're on Apple Podcast, Google Podcast, and Amazon Music as well. You can always find us there. And uh, we're excited to have you here. We're excited to see you growing and becoming the best version of yourself every day. With that being said, Adam. All right. Thank you so much. That's all we have for you today. All right. You have a wonderful week and God bless you.